Hey guys, welcome to my review of Limbo Eternal War. Now, as you can see, this is a very visually impressive game, but does it play any good? Well, let's get to the bottom of that right now. First things first, no index, garbage, right? Throw it in the trash. The fact that this is a board game miniature in a, in a board game is just insane. It just doesn't happen. That's wrong. Everything I just said was wrong. All right, now I could spend the next hour explaining this game. No, it doesn't actually take that long. It's not actually that complex. Um, there's minutia in it, and we're gonna get to that in a little bit. I will do a quick overview of how to play the game, but it'll be very, very basic. Um, if there's a video to be made about learning how to play this game, it's not the review, it needs to be its own video. Um, and that might be a thing that needs to happen, I don't know. Um, they go in and let me know if that is something that maybe you want, maybe I can put that together, it'd be a little bit of a work, but uh, I might be able to do that for you. Anyway, as far as the review goes and what you need to know in context, and I'll explain everything as I go, uh, you have minis, you have like an army here, and you can, you know, you have your army and you can equip them with, you know, different kind of, uh, uh, buffs and, uh, a different deity each time, and you can essentially kind of customize your, your characters that way. Your troops, you can have various amounts. So you can have, you know, three of these people and three of these, or two and two, or one and three, or, you know, three and two, or whatever it is. You can kind of customize that a little bit. You field them, bad guys start one side, good guys start another side, and then you fight. By fighting, what you do is you activate your people, so you go through and you, you kind of activate them, and they... And when you do that, you can do two actions, and that can be an attacking once in your turn, or moving, and you get movement points, or doing abilities. And then you have different abilities on your card, and they can be, you know, they can be a swift where it doesn't take an action, or one that does take an action, or maybe a passive. Um, all your characters have special stats and health and melee and ranged and defense and armor. You're rolling dice, you roll lots of dice, you do damage that way, you put the damage tokens on, you can debuff, you can do all that kind of stuff. A very typical skirmish game, uh, by and large. There's also a fate pool here. This is probably one of the bigger differences here is you have this fate uh, crystals. And as you try and do these special moves, sometimes they'll cost fate. And when they do, you actually give that to your opponent that can then eventually take it in and use it against you. So it's it's kind of this push-pull mechanic where you want to do your special ability, but then your opponent might be able to do theirs back, and so maybe you want to starve them. There's actually whole like deities that you get where it can actually take fate from the pool so people can do less of that. You end up getting all these cards, you can play these cards that allow you to do all sorts of different things. Uh, your whole deck is going to be unique, you can't even repeat them, so this is going to be a whole bunch of stuff, so you can draw cards and do stuff with this, and do extra attacks, and all that kind of cool, fancy stuff. Uh, there's the above ground stuff, there's the underground stuff, you have elevation, you have blocking terrain and difficult terrain, like lava and water and stuff like that. Uh, that is pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, that is pretty much all I'm going to explain here. I'll explain a little bit more as I go through, but in just, that's what you're doing. You're kind of going through and you're dealing damage, eventually you kill people, and then you can, you know, win the game. Now, there's various options of modes. You can do kind of a King of the Hill thing, you can do objective-based stuff, you can do deathmatch, you can actually do uh, more than two players if you even wanted to. There's all sorts of stuff you can do here, but that's really all I'm going to do. So, uh, let's go ahead and get into the actual review now. All right, so the first thing I want to point out, and really how I'm going to structure this review, is I'm going to go from your first experience down to your last. So I'm going to start with what, when you first get Limbo Eternal War, what do you see? And really, what you see is this. One of the nice things, and a very positive for me, is uh, a store solution for painters. And what I mean by that is... There's nothing grinding against this. There's no snap-in trays. There's nothing like that. All of the tray lids have these little dimples in it, these little divots that kind of just lightly press on the miniature, so there's not jostling around everywhere. But they freely come out, all of them do, in a very nice way that just makes it to where you can paint these beautifully and fit them right in there, and they'll look great. So that's a huge plus for me. It's also black. You know how much I like with the black ones. You're able to see the shape a lot more, so you can kind of see that there's like this spear thing here, maybe some wings here, and that. And you, and so you kind of know, okay, who might be there, right? In fact, it's this guy here. 
right? So you can kind of see that going in. When they're clear, um, it, it, it's a lot harder to see. And so I really like that they're black. Um, they're not, they're actually, see how they, you don't hear that? Like it's not crinkling like crazy right now. This is actually very good plastic. The storage solution here is quite, quite good. Um, there's not any spot for uh, tokens. I mean, like there are, There's it, you, you're not overstuffing anything. You just put them underneath the tray because there's lots of empty space there. Uh, there's not like little divots or anything like that to put those in, but it's a miniature storage solution. And really it, the game as a whole fits very nicely in the box. After you punch everything out, it just it works fine. In fact, there's more room to spare. All right, next I wanna talk about just the component quality in general, and really, it, it, it's hit or miss. Um, overall, I'm very happy with it. There's a few little nuggets, though, that are, are really annoying, and it, it's like they're almost there, right? And so all these cards have kind of this nice linen finish on it, so you can kind of hear that, all right? So there's a, kind of a nice feel to it. It feels like a, like a poker card, you know, like a typical bicycle card. Um, with that linen finish and uh, just about the thickness too. They feel just like that. So you, you could bridge these probably pretty well. <laughs> I don't suggest that though. Um, the miniatures are gorgeous. I mean, uh, I'll probably talk more about them in a second here, but miniatures look great. Uh, the art print on them, again, everything is clearly done. The writing is good. The colors work nicely. All of that's great. You get custom dice and you get a ton of them. I mean, you get like... I'm gonna go ahead and look at all of these dice you get. You get enough for two players to have their own pools of dice, and that's awesome. That is not done a lot, even in skirmish games. And they're custom too, so you got a nice little custom uh, symbol there. More on that later though. Um, but you get all these things there. You get a first player token that's like this nice metal, you know, good looking coin here, and this just looks great to so see who has initiative there. Uh, you get all these gems, and the gems are nice. You get tons of little gems. Uh, you get all of this stuff that looks quite good. And then you get stuff like these tokens here, which you'll notice are one-sided. So when you pour them out, I don't know what token this is. You have to flip it over and figure out what each one is. And that is super, super annoying. This is probably the my biggest beef about the component quality. These tokens, by the way, they're nice. They don't really have big tags. Um, they're, they feel really good. They have that kind of linen finish on them as well. Um, they're a good thickness, uh, good uh, card star quality, better than Kaman's uh, uh, Star uh, Starcadia quest. That's for sure. They beat the snot out of those. These are actually very good tokens, but that double sidedness really, really sucks. So that's a bummer to see. And it just oddities like that. So for instance, Wrath over here, very cool miniature. His base is upside down. So you see how everybody's base angles up and his angles down. It's a conve convex versus concave. So that his angles up like that. This should be flipped the other way. But they actually sculpted it that way. You can see it's it's hollow here. And and, and so just there's little things like that. And I, you know a lot of it's just kind of how indie Limbo uh, Miniatures is doing this. I mean this is their first board game, um, but. Everything else, honestly, besides the single-sided tokens, which does suck, besides the inverted base, which, yeah, it's fine. It's actually, it doesn't hurt me that. In fact, they actually kind of fit in uh, kind of nice, right? Because it's kind of like tectonic plates, right? They're just like sitting in there. So it's not terrible there actually either. Um, I'm still going to give this a positive. I think component quality-wise, they really did a quite good job with the card thickness and the print material and the, uh, the edges are nice. All the custom dice and all those dice actually look quite good too. Um, their black is actually less scuffed. This is this is well played. I've played quite a bit of this. Um, everything else is really, really good except the kind of few things I pointed. So that's kind of it for component quality. All right, now if there's one thing that is pretty much objectively fact, like if you're reviewing this game or thinking otherwise you're wrong, is that these miniatures are amazing. These are top tier Top of the line board game miniatures. These are fantastic. The sculpt design here is exquisite. And the uh, plastic they use to capture detail is fantastic. It's actually very, very good. I'll, I'll show you a few examples here. I did an unboxing of this with some really great lighting and like really up close and a spin table. You can see all the directions, perfect lighting and all that. So if you want to see that link below to my unboxing, you can just skip to the end if you want to see the miniature section of that. It's always at the end of my unboxing videos where I show the miniatures really nice. I'm just going to talk about them real quick and pick them up real quick, but the fact that this is a board game miniature in a, in a board game is just insane. It just doesn't happen. 
This is pushing the... You can understand now, when I have this, and then I get a Death May Die, you know, come on miniature guy, and it's just kind of standing there, why I can get disappointed, because this is what other board games are giving me now. And it's just, it's just insane. Like, like, look, look, this is not something you're used to seeing. Uh, just these crazy poses, these impressive kind of uh, 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 sculpt design. And it, it, it's topped off by some really good detail. So one of the things I always look for, for instance, are chains and whether or not the chain links actually like chain links. Well, there's not a chain in this game that doesn't look good. All the chain links look like chains. Imagine that. All the plates on here. Nothing is blurred or nothing's looking bad. Nothing's uh, not good. All the texture shows up well. It's just all good. And again, the, the poses here are just fantastic. Very, very, very well done. These miniatures are uh, amazing. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I kind of already showed you him. Here's Wrath. This is your lord here. They're huge. They're, I mean, I, I can't say it enough. These are great, great miniatures. And this is a... I fully support buying this game, even if you just want the miniatures. Now, I'm going to talk about why I like the game itself and why it's actually a good game. But otherwise, I mean, just... This is not a... You don't see this in miniatures. You see this in display pieces. This is like a pimped out display piece skirmish game. It's 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 fantastic. All this is ABS here, so it's nice and well, not straight, but it's the exact shape it should be. It's all just really good, very good miniatures. They're amazing. And and before I go, and I'm about to be done with this, I know I'm gushing over it. I just wanted to point out, like f this is an objective token. This is this is what you can fight over for, like an objective. You can put this on the map. I mean, that is, it's it's just insane that like that they did that, and they paint up. Beautifully. So I'm going to show you a few of my painted miniatures. I'm not the best painter, so forgive my painting if you're expecting like pro tier stuff here, but they paint up really, really good. I think so. I think they look great. And they do really good. I got one more after this, but uh, the scale is good. The proportions are good. The, the, there's no part like in between her altar and her dress that it like gets bad or anything like that. It all shows up well. It's just really, really fantastic stuff. Here is Gluttony, the demon. And again, just, just amazing. Very, very impressive stuff here. Like, this is not something you get from most board games. It really isn't. I know I'm saying that a lot. I just, I can't get over it. I, I geek out. I, I freak out. These are fantastic miniatures. Okay, but back to the game. Okay, now for the not so good, and it, it I purposely, okay, so uh, again, I'm going in order here, but I also purposely put these two together because they show kind of the range that this game can provide you from the highs to the lows. The lows being this rule book. Now, I'm going to make a pitch here and throughout this whole video on how there is a fantastic game hidden behind a terrible rule book. So let's get over that. First things first, no index, garbage, right? Throw it in the trash. Okay, don't actually need it, okay? But there's more here. Okay, so there's a lot of like formatting errors, just like basic, um, you would get docked on this if you turn this in as a, as a high school paper, unless that's college or something. Under upgrade cards, there's no space here. It's just cards dot each. Like th they didn't put a space after the sentence. And it's not even like that just happens once. I think it's also here on page um, 13. Yeah, while performing. Do you know while performing is a single word? It's not, but according to them, it is. So while performing here. Now, I'm actually going to stay on, I'm actually going to go to page 11 here and really kind of, actually, I think there's one more. Uh, there's mistakes in this game too, which is really kind of a bummer. For instance, falling in victory points. As soon as a character has received a number of damages equal to greater than half their health, they health, they fall. Uh, they fall meaning they're dead. Well, they don't die at half their health. The half part needs to go away. That shouldn't be there. That's an important part of the rule book. Like, hey, how do I die? If you read this and didn't know, you'd think, I guess, half your health and you're dead. It just doesn't make any sense. Page 11. Page 11 is fun. Okay. Uh, first of all, there's water instead of water. Um, this is, is a bummer. I mean, you, it's just hard to find out. Like, how, how do you tell what elevation is? Right? It says elevation is an important element to consider. 
uh, as well. And then it doesn't show elevation here. So it's difficult terrain. Here's what difficult terrain looks like. Here's what blocking terrain looks like, right? And you got the tree rock cliff. Where does it say elevation? It doesn't. You don't know. There's no way of knowing. Now, I'm going to pause here. This is on Board Game Geek, or I think it's also on the Facebook group. This is great. This is that map, but with actual stuff you can figure out. So, for instance, did you know... I magnetize these in, by the way. Did you know that this is elevation right here? You're going down a cliff. I didn't, but it is. See, it's right there. That's the elevation there, right? Which means that here's elevation here. That one's kind of a little bit more obvious, I suppose. But did you know that this is all elevation too? See, the, I thought this was hedges, but this is like vines coming down, I guess. I don't know. Or the fact that, uh, you know, like here's lava here. Did you know that this is water? That's water, so that's difficult terrain there. So that's right there. Or the blocking terrain can be really, really hard. Like this right here is blocking terrain. That's a rock. And this is also blocking terrain. But instead of putting actual, oh, I don't know, like like colored lines, because they have all the lines here, they didn't. And so they, they made this, and this is great. This is super useful. Or the starting, the start in your zone. It doesn't say what the zone is. Well, this is the zone. But how far does it go? There's no clear thing. Well, it goes to the corner of the blocking train. So right here is the last row. But if you thought it was this whole half, you're wrong. Same with here. Like, what shape is this? Can you start here? Can you start here? Yes, you can. It's just one block. You can start here, too, in this little corner here, according to this map. So the the map kind of sucks. Finding out the rule book kind of sucks. Let's go back to page uh, 11. This is a fun page. So. The other problem here is that half these rules read like a dyslexic wombat wrote them. It, 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 it just doesn't make any sense. It, I, I spent a good half an hour talking to my, uh, my patrons on Discord trying to figure out like what this was even saying. Listen to this here. When drawing line of sight between two characters on different levels, any space on a level not occupied by the character on the lower level is considered blocking terrain, except for any space occupied by the character on the higher level. What? Like, well, what, are you, what are you trying to say? Really, all they're saying is like, hey, when you attack, you can attack the person over there, but you can't see anything else. You can just kind of attack them. Okay, that's fine. But why are you wording it like this? When drawing a line of sight between two characters on different levels, any space on a level not occupied by the character on the lower level is considered blocking terrain, except for any space occupied by the character on the higher level. Well, well, what that is, there is about 1,500 different ways you could word it that are better than that. I could go ask my 10-year-old how to word that better. So, yeah, the rule book sucks. It sucks really, really bad. Um, lowest point, lowest of the lows when it comes to this game, which means it's only uphill from here. But if you can get past this rule book, if you can read the errata, if you can ask all the questions, if you can take notes on your first three gameplays and then talk to the designer like I did and try to figure out, okay, how do I even play this game correctly? Um, then you're good to go. For instance, for instance, these dice. Right? I was rolling these dice, and these dice are cool. Right? They got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and special. Right? And it says, hey, guess what? You critical on a five. And I thought that was really cool. In fact, I'd read a comment about somebody else who thought that was really cool that you don't critical on a six. So when you roll this, these sixes, while they're high, the five is actually awesome. Right? And so you're doing this, you're like, well, that's great. So you can roll this, and it, this five is better. If I had rolled all these sixes, the five could be better, depending on what I'm trying to do, because you can, they, it could be exploding dice. It could be uh, uh, all, all sorts of different things you can do here, right? Exploding dice are great, though. That's wrong. Everything I just said was wrong. This is a zero. So it's zero through five on the six-sided die. I didn't know that. The rulebook never said. The rulebook never states that. It, it just, like, like it, it kind of alludes to it in an example at one point where they said that they rolled zeros. Uh, and that's it. Otherwise, it never mentions that. And so stuff like that is just really hard to track and it's really frustrating as a player. So when you first get this, your worst games are going to be your first games as you try and wade through this. Now, in the new Kickstarter, they said they're going to redo that and they're going to improve it all. And that's fantastic. It's literally they couldn't make it worse. OK, now another fantastic thing about this game is that there is a ton of variety here. If you think it's just deathmatch, it's not. In fact, if you go here, it's going to list them all for you. It's going to be like, hey, pick a different game mode. You have Massacre. You have Underground. You have the Dragon Bane Blade. You have the Clash of Legends. You have Beacons for the Gods. You have Treasure Trove. You have Ambush. 
okay? And then you can come back here and actually read about them and what they do, and it's all great. And so you can do Massacre, that's typical deathmatch, right? You can do Underground where you're playing with the Underground and you have different portals that can go underground. You can come up the other way. Or I had one where I was like trying to invade them from the back, and so he, they sent some people back there, and we were kind of fighting on different levels there, which is kind of cool. You could play a game if you wanted to of just the underground. You can have objectives in the underground and above ground where you have to split your armies. So you have like a mini war there and then a major war up here because the large guys can't go down there. You have the Dragon Bane Blade where you place this Dragon Bane Blade and then whoever gets it, it then it has it buffed and then they do extra damage. But then if you kill them, they get it. Or you can have the Clash of Legends where you have uh, different points based off of the rank of the people and uh, people can become legendary and then they're stronger but they're worth more. Beacon for the Gods, Treasure Trove, and but wait, there's no Ambush. Again, this rule book sucks. So here it's gonna, it's gonna even tease you. Oh look, there's Ambush. That's what, no there's not. At least if there is, it doesn't exist in the back of the book. So, lots of awesome variety there in spite of the uh, rule book's faults. You can play this game in a ton of different ways. You can do objective base where you're going after the mission tokens or you're trying to control different areas. So you can have these altars around and you're just trying to control different altars. So it's kind of like a king of the hill with multiple hills. And then you're just trying to fight over that. There's all sorts of different ways you can do it. And they're all actually a lot of fun. They're, it changes your experience a lot and it just breathes new life into this game over and over again. Okay, now another positive thing, and this is the case for a lot of skirmish games, but not all, is that the setup time is very fast, as long as you know the team that you want. Picking the team can obviously take a long time, especially if you're trying different things, but normally, it's, like, it's kind of like deck building, where you're kind of thinking of a plan, of, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, and uh, I'll talk more about that, I guess, later, but really, uh, the setup time here is very quick. You got the board, you got the tokens, you, you got the gems, you, you laid on the tiles, uh, the underground tiles, the rule book doesn't tell you, but you can just lay them out however you want. It doesn't matter. You can make whatever map you want, as long as you have the two entry points. Um, and then you're good to go. You start rolling dice, you start moving, and that's it. So the setup time is very, very quick, which means you can get it to the table on a whim. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about the hero, the, just, the, I guess, the hero cards themselves, or the unit cards themselves, and just how unique they are. This is a huge positive here, because... It's not just that they have different stats, but they are truly unique. So, for instance, I'm going to take Raphael here. I'm going to make sure that you're kind of, you can see what it is I'm looking at. Let me kind of get a little bit closer. There you go. I think you can see that pretty good. Okay, so here you have Raphael, or, or Raphael, or whatever it is. I don't know what her name is. Anyway, you have here Guardian, Holy, Human, and then a Technomancer. And then you have her health of 21, her attack of 4, her defense of 3, her armor of 2, and her movement of 4. All of this is unique. All of this matters. These uh, uh, words up here matter based off some rules, based off other cards, based off cards you can play. Then down here you have kind of their different things you can do. So she can channel or she can uh, gain uh, ad advantage. Uh, then she has all this stuff here where she can wound on a critical, she can reach so she can move farther, she can pierce one through armor, she's immune to effects, she can fly, she's huge, and she has deadly two, which means you're timesing to her damage. And then her cost of 14 and her rank. So all of that's unique, but then even more, all of these are as well. So I kind of talked about how these are all different. So this is an action you have to take. It takes one of your two actions when it's filled out and then two passes. But if you read like Blade Cyclone, it's going to cost three fate. And it says each character Raphael threatens takes X dice of damage where X equals her attack plus one. Reduce each character's armor by her pierce value when, while resolving this ability. So she can just spin around with her blades and attack everybody. Again, super cool, right? Then you have Gluttony, and again, he has all different stuff everywhere. Look, 30 health, but zero uh, armor, so, you know, but four defense. Uh, and then he has Beast, which makes him really strong. Same with Brood. Both of those are huge. And then he only has huge reach and daze, and he can only focus. Um, however, you'll look here, and he has the Aura of or, uh, Gruesome Feasts. So for his attack, he can attack for three with a Deadly 2, Pierce 1. So it's less than his attack of six. So he's not going to do as much, though he does have Deadly and a pierce. After this attack resolves, recover X, where X equals the amount of damage the defender received plus one. So he can kind of heal himself. He can literally consume other people and uh, heal like that. So he can be really tough to kill. And they get crazy. I'm going to read one more to you here. This is Henrill. And if you want to know just how unique these, these units are and how 
Uh, you can tell kind of the depth of the theory crafting you can do with them. Again, he's a hunter, human, rogue, marksman. We're going to get to the cards there in a second. But you have uh, Blessed Bolt for two. You have Concentrated Ward. And then you have this Break the Seal. I want to read Break the Seal to you. This is a reactionary thing here. When Hinro's health is equal or less than two, so in other words, when he's really low on health, right? He starts with seven. Then recover two, so you get to actually recover some health. You get to do an attack plus three, and you cannot use ranged weapons. So suddenly his crossbow, he's not using anymore. He has a defense plus one, a speed plus one, and he places a wound token on himself, and he cannot use the trait human for the rest of the game. So he loses a human trait. In other words, this character and his lore and all that, he's no longer human. He gets this kind of like crazy, I don't know if it's like a demon form or what. I haven't read his lore quite yet. Um, but that break the seal where suddenly once he gets hurt enough, he just reacts and just explodes in this huge amount of power is crazy cool, super unique. And again, when you're playing him, that's going to be a totally different experience on how you deal with him. You're going to want to kill him dead because if you don't, he's going to hit you hard. That kind of stuff is just all throughout this. All of these units are good. Uh, Eladariath, fantastic ranged unit, right? Veronica, very, very good at dealing damage and shielding people. Uh, Betragard, this dude is a walking tank. All of these guys are cool. Uh, this, uh, the Rose of Thorns, all of the Rose Knights here uh, benefit from each other. So if some fall, the others get buffed and they all interact together like that. This is just really, really fantastic unit design. Um, uh, in my opinion, this is more unique than Mythic Battles Pantheon. This is more unique than all of those. These are really, really good because each one stands on its own. It's not like... Oh, there's some standout ones. I could have picked any cards and talked about how different they are and the strategies you can do with them. This guy here, all I just use him as a debuff. He's just walking around his aura, just debuffing people. Again, tons and tons of stuff here. Okay, next up I want to talk about just the amount of customization. This is another huge plus. When I talked about knowing your army, I'm going to explain why because of all the different choices that you have here. So step one is to pick how many points you have, right? So here's all the points right, that you're, you're kind of picking, like, uh, Veronica here is 12 points, and Eladariath here is 9 points, and then you get something like the Shield Guard, who for 1 is 5, for 2 is 9, so you saved a point there, and then for 3 is 13, right, so depending on how many you want to deploy there. But then picking how many heroes you have, you always have to have a Lord, but what Lord you want, and then how many troops you want, you can change that. I'm going to change the focus here a little bit to go back. All right. But it's more than that. Then you also can pick a deity. And there are multiple deities you can pick from. And all of them kind of change. So here's a neutral guy. Rulebook doesn't tell you that, but purple's neutral. You have these bad guys and you have these good deities. And depending on which one you pick, again, they change what you're doing a ton. All of these act different. This trickster guy, you can use other people's abilities. So if you use an ability, they can do that. If you use a holy ability, that demon can use that holy ability later because you get to ignore it. It's an evil, evil trickster card. Uh, so all of these are different. So then you pick that. Then you can pick your your units, and you can have as many or as few as you want because, first of all, you're choosing the points. But then you also have these uh, kind of equipment kind of cards or enhancement cards. So this is a favored one. It's for the light side only. For a hero lord only, this character gains a holy trait. And when this character activates, if you have fewer fate in your pool than your opponent, shift one fate to your pool. So you can gain fate plus you gain holy. Why would you want to gain holy? Well, maybe you want to be able to use Polymorphous. Or polymorph, which only works for holy units. So you can make a non-holy unit that's normally not holy, holy through that. Or you can have unlimited power. That's going to cost you three. It's a neutral one, so anybody can use this. This character gains a channel skill. A channel skill is where they get to essentially um, channel a fate onto there so that the, maybe the lioness roar now costs less because you're actively gaining stuff. So you can, you can do stuff like that. There's all these different ones that you can do. There's Adamantium Augment for two. This character or group gains Pierce two during melee attacks. So suddenly you have a Pierce two, and again, they gain Pierce two. So if you already had Pierce two, suddenly you're a Pierce four, you can pierce through all of all of his defense. Well, I guess it's armor, but um, either way, you can like really just kind of get at people that would normally be hard to hit. Uh, Gouge is pretty defensive, so that'd be great against him. And so you can do all of these. And so you might have shield guards, which are naturally normally not super uh, attacky, and then suddenly make them these walking machines. So a shield guard with that is much different than a shield guard with something else. Uh, 
it just, it really, really changes things. And there's quite a few. Now, there are repeats because you can have multiple people. But maybe you get your shield guard here and you had heavy plating. This character group gains one armor. So suddenly you have more armor now. It costs two, but that whole troop unit has more armor. A whole armor is a huge thing, by the way. I'll talk about that later. But, you know, uh, embracing unlife. This character group gains the undead trait and immune. So suddenly they're immune to different things. And in fact, sometimes you can even like bring about battle hardened where they gain accuracy. I mean, there's all of these disciplined where they get the command skills. So suddenly you can command troops and buff up your troops more. Uh, there's all natural leaders. There's all of these different ones that you can do. Survival instincts um, that you can combine with that. So you are picking the points. You are picking the map. You're picking your position on the map when you deploy them. You're picking your deity. You're picking your units. You're picking your uh, buffs here. And you're picking 20 of these cards. And again, they kind of depend on who they work for, right? This only works for a beast. Uh, this only this works for anybody. This only works for a holy unit. And all of these, again, have a cost here. Now, this cost is for in the game, but really what on this, you just have to pick 20 unique ones. So you're, you're kind of theory crafting your deck here. And there are plenty here. So again, you can pick plenty. So there's a ton here that you can pick from. So highly, highly customizable. And from what I can tell, um, you can pick an army that's better than another. I think you can pick poorly and maybe not having a lot, a lot of synergies or just kind of just do something silly like that. Um, however, for the most part, especially when they pick like how many troops you can have per hero and stuff like that, it's actually fairly well balanced uh, from what I've played. Um, it seems both sides have good strategies that work pretty well. And again, the customization here, awesome. Okay, now I've talked a little bit about the fate system, and I just want to highlight that a little bit. This fate system is great. It, it, the, the whole idea of I want to use my lioness roar for three, and so I'm going to be able to, you know, channel. So I actually grab a few here. So I actually, you know, channel one on her, and maybe, maybe I channel th for three different turns and have her hero because the heroes can do a, a one. And so instead of using the focus, I'm just going to channel. Now I can use it and keep mine, and I can just use these for free. And these are just gone. They're just out of the game. I don't have to give it to them, right? I'm only giving them these. Or maybe, you know what? I want to use it right away and I want to use it twice. So afterwards, I'm going to use another three on my next turn and do it all over again. Well, that was good for me, but now you can take three of these. So suddenly, you know, you might have all these and you won't even have to focus. So instead, you can just gain advantage or something. There's all these different things at play. And what I love about it is that it's not just one thing. Your cards can affect the fate and what you're doing. You're, I already talked about how your deity can. There's a deity here. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it, it's in a, a, so when I was playing, I, I saved a deck. But anyway, uh, where they get to actively take them out of the game. So they're going away from the game. So suddenly people have less and less, right? Which can finally change it. If you picked one that has channel heavy, but they use all these expensive attacks, and then you're planning on just kind of dipping in both, well, that sucks if you're losing them, right? Then suddenly you can't do that. That can like debilitate an enemy. It debilitates you a little bit too because you don't get as much. So it it just all depends. But the between this affecting it and this affecting it and this affecting it and this affecting it, it's very well integrated into all parts of the game and it works really, really well. It's really cool to be able to do that, whether you're gaining some or losing some or spending some and that kind of trade-off and push-pull. The fate system is awesome. I, I really, really enjoy it. I think it works out quite well. Additionally, one of the other good things I didn't mention about it is there's a bidding system. So starting first is huge. For instance, for instance, let's say we're right here, okay? Now, and I, I'm right here. If I, if Wrath, the character, goes first, he's going to murderize this, this chick. This chick is dead, right? So it's in my best interest to be able to use this first because maybe I can attack and then move away and maybe I can slip away and not even get an attack of opportunity. Or maybe I just want to go out in a blaze of glory or maybe I can kill her first because she's actually pretty squishy and weak so that I traded a hero for a troop. Very good deal, even if she dies. I want to get that first. Of course, the Wrath character, the person playing him, really wants this so they can just pulverize this person and keep their, their kind of weak hero and be able to actually attack her. Or maybe they want to use her first and actually just save Wrath and to see what happens. So there's a lot of strategy there, of course, but whoever gets this token, you really want this token. Generally speaking, it's something you want to fight for, though not always. And that's what's great. So everybody starts with three. Each team does. And you secretly either spend one, two, or three of your gems to get 
this token and a tie it's the person who doesn't have it so let's say i really want it and let's say they really want it so we're probably both going to bid high right maybe i bid all three now the difference between the bid you have to give to the other person whoever won so if i bid three and they bid nothing I have to give them all three of mine. Suddenly they gained three gems. So I made them more stronger, but I got the initiative. So I really, really want it. But maybe I don't want to give them all three. So maybe I can win with just two. So I'm just going to do two. That way I still have one if nothing else. And then maybe I won with two. Or maybe, oh, they did three. Now I lost it. So that bidding concept of not only are you just secretly deciding who gets the initiative at the start of each round, but the concept of that you're going to have to benefit the other person if you overbid. So you don't want to go on. Sometimes if you just want gems and the gems are more important than that, or the fate is more important than the token, you're just going to bid nothing and hope that they bid high. And a lot of times that also, you get kind of almost that poker thing where you're like, well, I want them to believe I really want it. Right. So maybe I'm, I'm struggling to decide and I really don't. I, I picked long ago. I wasn't going to put anything down, but you kind of do that different thing. It's a great little touch. And again, another way to interact with the fate gems. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about these cards because these these fake cards are again very good and they're really really nice. You can play them when it's not your turn. Sometimes there are times where you can enchant or do something else, but they also just work out really good. You can do so much with this. This really changes it. For instance, Polymorph, enchant a character of equal or lower rank within three in sight. X equals one plus the character's rank. Okay, so you're going to enchant another character, right? This one you're going to want to enchant another team character enchant your base attack and armor value is zero your base defense and speed value is zero when the activation phase ends discard this card they actually gave you a uh miniature of a sheep so you pretty much just sheep uh, sheep them so you could actually because it's uh equal or lower rank so if you played this if you made veronica here holy right like this one now suddenly she can make wrath a sheep so for the next turn He's a sheep. He's super weak. He can't hurt anybody. And you just made this giant demon lord into a sheep. It's it's hilarious. It's fantastic. Stuff like that's cool. Maybe courage. Again, maybe you made a human deck, right? Like this one. There's actually quite a few humans. Human, human, human. Uh, and actually Veronica, human as well. Courage. When you would gain a bane, ignore it, and then recover three. So you just turn the tide. Somebody just hurt you and gained a bane. But you know what? You play this card, right? It's a reaction card for nothing. And then suddenly, guess what? You actually healed instead, and you don't even get the bane. Learn from the past. This is for humans. Again, human, 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 human. So you can kind of double dip in these human things. Uh, play learn from the past as a copy of any fake card in your discard pile, where X equals that card's cost plus one, which means you can polymorph twice with learn from the past. So if you have a whole bunch of heroes that are holy, you got it. This one can only work on a hero, so a troop can't use that. In fact, a lord can't use that. When an activation ends, ready this character. So suddenly they can go twice in a turn. That's great. Defensive stance for a guardian, a guardian like Veronica, but you couldn't use this for Eldrith. When you are attacked, boost defense self, the attacker gains disadvantage during this attack. So suddenly they win and attack, oh, I'm going to squish this character, right? And then suddenly they gain a disadvantage plus you're boosted in defense. So suddenly, guess what? You got a defensive stance. Now, I said they can use that one, but Eldrath is a beast, and a beast can do this where they can do an attack, even if you've already attacked this activation. Bam, you attacked twice. That's huge. Poking the bear, when you take three or more damage and a single attack, ready your character or squad card. Again, you can ready your entire thing again. The Knight's Challenge. All of these things are interesting and cool and different. They are really, really good, and I really enjoy them. I think they work quite well. Now... There is a bit of a bummer here, and just a bit. As good as these are, you tend to play the same ones over and over again. Why is that? Um, for for the most part, if you don't have any humans, right, then you're not going to play a whole bunch of human ones. Um, but this is a deck of 20. You have to have 20. This is 20. This is all the cards, which means another 20 would go away. You know, maybe, maybe right about there. That looks pretty close. Maybe... Maybe two more in here. All right. So this is all the cards that were not picked. Now, a lot of these are repeats because you'll have multiple. You Normally, you'll have two, especially with the any. So you're going to have two dashes. There's already a dash in that one. Two impervious. Uh, you might even have, you know, uh, two of a certain one here as well. It just kind of depends. Uh, here's fearsome to behold. There's two of them because one player could do it and the other player could both get them because both could have brutes. So there's not quite as many options as you would think. While they're all unique and all great, you do tend to see the same ones 
um, multiple times, depending on if you, you know, were able to draw them or not. And there are whole mechanics on how to be able to draw. And you could have a deck where you just draw a whole bunch, and that could help you do that. Or I guess a whole setup of your characters could help with that too. Either way, I think they work great and they're fantastic. Okay, now I want to explain another mechanic here that I think really makes this unique. The fate system is one. I think the fate system is one. I think the ability to manipulate your troops, not just pick troops, but also the equipment and the deity and the point system and how many of each one you get and all that kind of stuff. Um, but is the advantage and disadvantage system. So let me kind of explain that a little bit. So let's say these two are going to fight. Okay, so they're going to fight to the death, of course. There's no other way. Now... They can both gain advantage and disadvantage. So maybe maybe he gained a point of advantage, but two points of disadvantage, right? And then she only gained one point of advantage, right? So that's minus one, so a disadvantage, and a plus one. So it's one advantage versus one disadvantage. So they definitely have advantage. All you're trying to see is who, if it's an advantageous attack or a disadvantageous attack. And what's the difference? Well, the difference is not anything in particular. So let's say that her attack... I don't even have her card here. Let's say her attack is three, okay? For every point of advantage or disadvantage, you're going to gain one. So if it's a, let's say it's an advantage of two. You're going to gain two dice, okay? Let's say it's an advantage, a disadvantage of two. You're going to gain two dice. Now, why would you roll more dice for a disadvantage attack? Well, let me explain. So either way, advantage or disadvantage, you're rolling two more dice. Now, nothing about your attack ever changes. What I mean by that is... Her three dice are all that are ever going to be there unless you explode dice. Okay, so she rolled this, and I'll explain this real quick. Okay, so I'm keeping three of these. If I'm advantage, I get to pick the ones I get rid of. I'm going to get rid of the one and the two. So I'm going to keep the five, two, and three, and I'm going to explode that to add another die to my five, which is another five. And again, I mean, this is, I mean, so that wasn't really a good roll, but whatever, a three. Okay, that's not my attack. That's a good attack, right? Let's reverse that and say that I had disadvantage. Disadvantage the other person picks. So they're going to pick the five and the three. Now look at my attack. Same three dice. I'm always doing three. But if you have disadvantage, the in, the enemy player gets to pick what you get rid of. If you're advantage, the, you get to pick. And that is huge. You saw the difference there. The difference between these two roles is massive. It is such a, a, a an appreciable difference that it feels huge. Now, when I first read this, I was kind of concerned. I was like, I don't like the idea of always getting, like, if I'm advantaged, just let me keep the dice. Why would I, like, I almost felt like I should, like, lose dice at disadvantage and gain dice at advantage. But I also like always rolling the dice. And again, if you rolled good, if these were all fives, getting rid of two, it doesn't really matter, right? If you rolled good, you rolled good. In this case, I had a lucky five with another explosion dice, and I had some low ones as well. That's when it really matters. So sometimes it kind of averages out. It just it kind of depends still on your roll, obviously. But you really get to manipulate it there in a very good way to where you can really change the value of that attack a ton. Now, while, while I'm talking about this, I really wanted to uh, just quickly talk about how you're doing damage. So you actually do division, right? So this is what? 10 plus 3 is 13. Let's say they're attacking, uh, oh, I, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Let's let's go ahead and do here. Let's go on and do Veronica. Let's see they're attacking Veronica for thirteen, right? Now she has a defense of four and an armor of three. Okay, so four, five, six, seven total is what you're doing. You're doing essentially thirteen divided by seven. Okay. Now what that means is that you would take one damage, right? Because you would need fourteen to do two damage. And all those others are lost. It's kind of what that goes for. Now, the reason that's a big deal is because that means that each one of these armor or each one of these uh, defense are huge, which means if you have a pierce two, that's huge. Adding a pierce two is huge. If it was a pierce two, that means it would be four, five. And so suddenly you're doing two damage instead of three. If you have deadly as well, so if you do a pierce on a deadly, you're doubling that. So instead of two, you're doing four damage. So with this attack, suddenly with one armor off or two armor off and deadly, you're doing four damage versus one. So the division I think is actually really good. It's quite easy to do. It's not super advanced. 
Um, you, you get the hang of it very quickly on what your, the damage is because you're not doing anything crazy here. And it makes it to where these pierces, it makes it to where these armor points, just a single one is so big or a defense one is so big that it, it's just, it's really, really important because it makes a big difference. It can be the difference between one damage and three damage, which uh, for this is big, especially if you get to, to the multiple. Right? I mean, it, once you get to a big roll, when you got a whole bunch going on there, that can really hurt you. But if you're dividing by a bigger number, that's very appreciable versus just a straight minus. So the the upgrades are very impactful because of that and something I actually really like. And again, helps make it unique. Now, I just want to say, and I've mentioned this a few times, that I really do appreciate the amount uh, or the, I guess the various types of abilities that you have, specifically when it just comes to these symbols here. I've kind of talked about it a little bit, but the fact that you have to take an action versus a protection or a, a, a passive versus a reaction versus a swift is what they call this. So her lioness roar, it, it costs three, which is expensive, but guess what? you can just do it, right? Because it doesn't actually take a action, so it's not one of your two actions. So you can do that in addition to attacking and moving, which makes it quite cool. Additionally, heroes and above get to do one of these for free. Normally, for instance, you have the shield guard on a troop and they can guard or they can focus, uh, which is great, but it would take one of their actions. However, a hero or above can do it for free. So you can go ahead and focus and gain that advantage. You can do the Lioness Roar, and then you can do the Savage Pounce. And notice, the Savage Pounce does not have attack uh, bolded, which means it doesn't count as your attack. So then you could do an attack after that if you're not actually uh, you know, spending it. The uh, abilities that you have here and the variety here are so strategic and so good and so varied. And uh, it just... I really appreciate strategic games where if I win, it's because I had a good plan and it worked out and I reacted well to other plans and stuff like that. There's a little bit of excitement. You got this exploding dining, you got all that, but all that averages out, especially when the other person's dealing with the same thing. So it just kind of all averages out and it ends up being just, you know, who designed a better team and played their cards better and did the different abilities that kind of work together well. And you can really do that. Like the shield guard to get a shield token on them, but then they can give it to another person they're adjacent to. So they can kind of like take the, the you know, the brunt of it, right? And be like, here, I'll help protect you. So having having your, your lord protected by them is huge, but maybe you want to protect their weak character instead. There's all these different options and all these different abilities here that really just make this a really, really entertaining game to do and uh, there's tons of different ways just to play a single character. All right, now a little bit of negativity here again. Uh, there could be more map options. There's this one and there's the reverse, which is just uh, uh, kind of the same kind of thing. It's laid out a bit different. You know, there's definitely different paths and lanes and zones and stuff like that. And it's like all winter, so it looks a lot different as well. Plus you have the underground, but still having more varied things would be uh, kind of interesting. Maybe one that has a lot of different elevation or multiple sets of elevation or ones that are really just straight lines. And so you kind of have to pick a lane and then you can't get out of that lane you know, would be kind of cool. Impassable walls or something like that. Or maybe there's a lava in between it. So you have to, but you might take damage for it. So for a flyer, you know, uh, there are tons of different ways you can do maps. And I think different maps uh, would definitely be welcome here. Additionally, the cardboard here is actually quite thin and you do get a little bit of warpage from that. So uh, it's good cardboard, but you can kind of see the bend a little bit even. And so it kind of has a little bit of a wobble. It's not major but it is quite thin and I would have liked to see maybe some better card stock used. It's okay, but it could definitely improve. Okay, so I'm almost done here. Before I finish, I, I, one of the things I wanna say is I'm really looking for the next Kickstarter. And the reason why is because I want more options for my army. Now there are a ton of options. So you have you know, all of your heroes, right? Which is great, you have up to two lords. So obviously more lords would be welcome, but there's a lot that you can do here. Right. I mean, you can really double up on you can have a whole bunch of archers. Right. Or maybe you have a whole bunch of halberdiers or a whole rose knight. Rose knights plus the rose's thorn. That would be great. Right. And then, of course, all the enemies have the bad guys have one as well. And then you even have mercenaries. So you have this kind of green version here. These can be on either team. They're kind of for hire. And you even have like, hey, that's what that's an angel. No. Nope. Well, you know what? That angel will even work with demons. So the, the variety is there already, and I'm very happy with the amount of stuff because you can very theme it. You can have an all angels group versus an all demons group. You can have a whole bunch of humans. You can do all that kind of stuff. You can't quite do like an undead yet though because both of the lords 
for the demon or for, for the bad guys are demons. There's no undead version of it. This guy here is uh, not a lord. He's a hero. So, you know, getting more options would just be great. So as much as this is, uh, I'm looking forward to this, I'm looking much more forward to the Kickstarter where I can get more units and really just have an amazing amount of options available to me. Okay, I'll, I have two more points to make. So, um, and then I'll kind of summarize at the very end here. Uh, the game flow is very, very nice and it's very speedy. And one of the reasons is, is because you're fairly limited in the amount of cards you have. So when you have all these cards in your hand, you, you don't have, you know, too many. And there's only two actions per person and an alternate. So if I activate somebody, then you activate somebody and then I activate somebody. So you're always kind of interacting. Um, which I think is very, very nice. Now you don't have to roll defense, which means attack rolls are just, you roll it, that's the damage. It's very deterministic in that way. Um, and sometimes you can play a card, but it's quite, you know, it's, it doesn't happen very often where you can play a card in reaction to after the attack versus before the attack. But in general, you move and you attack or you do some special and then you attack or you do some special and then move or you move twice or you charge or whatever it is you do. Um, it's just two actions. And so it's very quick where it's like, okay, I'm going to move up here and then I'm going to attack. Okay, I'm done with Gouch. Then maybe I'm going to activate him and he's going to move up here and uh, attack up there or whatever it might be. Um, or maybe he's going to get rid of this guy. It, it doesn't matter. The point is two actions, you're done. Maybe some card play, maybe a, a swift that allows you to do something besides the two actions. But for the most part, the game runs very smoothly. You never are twiddling your thumbs too often. Uh, once you're sitting down, you're playing, you're just playing and it runs, runs like a well-oiled machine. The last point I want to make out is how versatile of a game engine this box really provides. And what I mean by that is it is quite open-ended. For instance, you want to get rid of this board? Get rid of the board. Just make an ultimate underground board. Everybody's underground. You have all these like small little passageways and you can customize that however you want. That's not even half the board uh, tile. So you could make this whole you know, maze of an underground thing. Sure, go for it. You want to add these King of the Hill altars where you get buffs while in there or extra victory points from it uh, in other game modes? Sure, have a death match where you can also have this and have it to where like you're doing... I mean, you can do a ton of different stuff here. Maybe you want this plus a Hero's Bane blow, uh, the, the blade that buffs you. So you have both there. Why not? Or, you know, make them kind of the legendary people. You can do that. You want to be able to have two bad guys fight? You can do that. Two heroes groups fight? You can do that. All of that is available to you. You can kind of do whatever it is you want. You can pick your uh, victory point or your uh, your recruitment points. You want a huge army? Sure, it sounds like fun. Why not do it once or twice? Maybe it's dumb, maybe it's not. You want to have a whole group of just troops going at it? Go for it. This game really allows for a lot of customization, not just in your own army, but just in the overall setup of it. I would love to have something where maybe it's just the big heroes up here and nothing but troops down there. So it's a troop versus troop in the underground and then the heroes down there. Or, or, or maybe uh, the heroes, you know, are, are like it's just the lords here and then the heroes are there and you have to figure out how to get there. It would just be really cool. There's a lot of stuff here you could do, a lot of possibility here. The versatility and the rule system and the structure of the game allow for a huge amount that uh, just makes me want to play again and again. Just setting this up made me want to play it again. And really, I think that is the the best i can describe this game is that the fact that the moment i saw this i wanted to play again the moment i started taking on cards i was thinking oh i could do this and i could do that and i could build this i want to craft an army right now i want to go through here and see okay if if we only had 50 points and i could definitely get a full shield guard and actually make them with the pierce two or maybe even more armor and they'd be super maybe i want to make a super defensive army that just doesn't have a whole bunch of armor on them and guard and they're all guarding and it's very hard to kill them all or maybe i want a glass cannon one where i just have all these like swift moving angels that could die really quick and all that kind of stuff. it just it's exciting the miniatures fantastic the art looks great uh, there are some bad parts like the, you know, it's hard to read the map and the tokens are one sided and uh, th there's some bummers around there for sure. But otherwise, there's some really fantastic, strategic, highly strategic, um, highly rewarding, highly exciting game systems in here to where you can do a whole lot. The fate system, the advantage versus disadvantage, the uh, uh, ability to play fate cards, uh, uh, the, the, the dice was a zero. Um, all of that is very, very fascinating. The, the division and the attack, it just works well. This has been such a surprise for me. I backed this 
because I thought the fate system looked good and because I thought the miniatures looked great. That's literally it. That's what it took for me. Obviously, the, I, w I, I knew I'd be safe because if nothing else, I'd paint the miniatures and be happy. And I thought the fate system, because I love push-pull uh, mechanics, I love the kind of uh, press-your-luck mechanics that that provides where you're, you're kind of have a shared resource system there. So that excited me. I didn't understand the advantage-disadvantage. I didn't really understand the division or all, the amount of complexity here. Once I got the rules down and once we really started playing this game, it has been a huge hit, and I cannot wait for the next Kickstarter. Uh, I will be one of the first backers there for sure. Literally, this is um, in the running for my game of the year. Um, it just, it again, once you get these rules down, once you get that terrible rule book down, it is great. There's not really anything else I can say about that. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If you have any rules questions, again, feel free to ask them. I've asked a lot myself. Hopefully I can help you out there. Um, it is a little wonky there. Once they get that new rule book out, I can guarantee this is going to be a game that a lot of people are going to really appreciate. All right, but that's it for me, guys. I hope you enjoyed the review. I know it's extra long. I know it's detailed. It's just I don't know any other way to review a game except to give you plenty of examples and say every single thing because I don't want to leave anything out. So hopefully I answered all your questions here. Uh, it, again, if you have any others, feel free to put them in the comments below. If you appreciated the video and the effort I took into explaining everything and showing you all this, feel free to press a like. That always helps the channel out, that helps the video out, helps me out, and it makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons and my YouTube members. You guys rock. You guys make all this kind of stuff possible so that I can purchase these uh, risky indie games like this and then find these hidden treasures that I love so much. Uh, literally, like, I, I, this would not be a thing. I wouldn't be able just to back something that might not even work out too well without your guys' support. So thank you so much for that. And as always, I will talk to you very soon. Mm -hmm.